Hi, it's Derek Sloan, leader of the Ontario Party. I'm here with Tom Marazzo and Rick Nichols. We're in the media studio here at Queen's Park. We've just completed a press conference on the digital ID that's being proposed here in Ontario. And we thought that it would be great to bring someone here who's lived through government overreach and has some great comments to make on the digital ID. The digital ID is a way to have your identity in, in sort of one location online. Instead of having a driver's license or a passport, you can have a digital ID that you know you can show to buy a lottery ticket, open a bank account, things like this. We believe that a digital ID partnered with a, a digital currency, which many central banks are proposing, is a recipe for uh, security issues, but also government abuse and coercion, wherein a government could flip the switch and you would be unable to buy anything, sell anything, um, pay your mortgage, buy medication, things like this. And one of the reporters here asked us a question. Well, you know, I, I respect the concerns, he said, and I respect the, uh, the slippery slope argument. But how do you get from, you know, just having a digital ID that's optional to, you know, the government turning you off, pre preventing you from buying medication, things like this. And I answered and said, you know, when you have the infrastructure in place, it becomes so tempting to use it. And I just want to let Tom talk a little bit about his experience being a leader at the trucker convoy in Ottawa of how easily the government shut him out of the system and how much more easily they could do so if a digital ID was in place. Thanks, Derek. And uh, again, my name is Tom Marazzo and I'm running this uh, June in Peterborough, Kawartha. And I was witnessing or, or watching the, uh, the press conference and uh, again, the question came up about the, the slippery slope. And, and Derek gave some great examples, of course, related to the convoy. But, but one of the, the issues that's not really widely known about FinTrack, FinTrack was uh, a framework or infrastructure that was already in place by the government. And the role of FinTrack was to track uh, domestic terrorist funding or international funding of terrorism. And at no time, were we ever designated as a terrorist organization of any kind during our time in Ottawa? But this is again, a great example of government overreach. They used an in, uh, uh, in place infrastructure that they already had and they abused it, they, they misabused it and they targeted our bank accounts, all of our financial institutions. And, and to the point where, uh, for example, my, my son who needs heart medication my credit card was at on file with his drugstore. My credit card was frozen and my son could not get the heart medication. And luckily we actually had cash in the house to pay for the heart medication. Otherwise we wouldn't have been able to get any medication for my son because the government of Ontario or the, uh, sorry, the federal government uh, used FinTrack to attack all of our financial institutions. And I wanna be clear, there was never a warrant for my arrest. I was never charged. I have not been charged to this day. And from the moment that the Emergency Act was, was invoked to the very conclusion of it, I was frozen out of all of my financial assets. On top of that, under the FinTrack, and I confirmed this with my lawyer, Keith Wilson, with the JCCF, the government is not supposed to, using FinTrack, actually go after uh, joint accounts. So my wife's and mine are joint accounts joint accounts were also taken away and credit cards were taken away joint credit cards and credit scores were directly affected by this so when you talk about the infrastructure being abused we've already seen an example of it and now if we tie this digital id to uh try to consolidate every you know digital um uh, piece in our lives when is it going to be when law enforcement decides that they want to come up with more legislation to to be able to target that and use that as a weapon uh, against its own citizens? And, and so that for me is a very terrifying uh, proposition for residents of Ontario. Uh, and and if, if we allow this to happen in Ontario, you know that it's going to create a framework or a model for this to spread across the rest of Canada. And so your ability to exercise your your charter rights you know, specifically Section 2, are going to be taken away if you exercise your Charter 2 or uh, Section 2 of your Charter and the government doesn't like it, they're going to go and give this tool to law enforcement and take away every possible means for you to participate in this society. And to me, that's fundamentally wrong.
Yeah, those are great comments, Tom. And, you know, another way they could use this as well is uh, if they impose more lockdowns on us or, or other COVID measures, they could say, well, you can't travel more than 10 kilometers from your house mm -hmm. and you could uh, you you could just be turned off. You, yes. you could be unable to use your uh, buy anything, buy gas, buy food if you're away from your house. So it gives the architecture for totalitarian overreach. And you pointed out that in your situation, thank God you guys had cash on hand. Yes. But if we move to a cashless society or a digital currency, uh, you would have been up the creek. Yeah. And yeah. that's a frightening thing to think about. And, and I think another uh, frightening aspect of this, when I taught at Georgian College, I actually taught in the artificial intelligence program. One of my students was a Chinese student who actually came in, in, in the week we talked about digital IDs. It was like I brought in a guest lecture. He taught or talked about his role in China and developing digital ID type of, of software for the company he worked for. So this is very integrative within all facets of your society. And, you know, it, it's it's I, I do agree there are conveniences, but when you're allowing for an artificial intelligence, which this will have to be predicated on an artificial intelligence framework of some kind, where's the human component to this? Like you said, if if you are, um, you know, forbidden during a lockdown to go five kilometers from your home, well, maybe my my pharmacy is outside of that bubble. Is is the algorithms, is the software going to be able to detect that thing? Where is the human element to my specific case? Because you're really just brought under a big umbrella of uh, a digital ID type of system that is meant to social engineer or modify behavior of your public. And it's not being done by human beings. It's actually done by an automated system of artificial intelligence. And for me, I find that to be a very, very terrifying thing in a free and democratic society when the AI is making the decisions and there's no human in the loop. Well, the interesting thing is that we just had a system which was digitally based that cr created two tiers of society, mm. the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Yes. Right. So we had a system where people were showing things on their phone and it and it and it enabled them to either access certain privileges or not. Yes. And so the idea that this could never happen or that it could never be expanded, I think, is naive. Yes. Uh, we've just seen it. We've seen uh, the government stoking uh, division yes. and polarization amongst different groups. Imagine if, again, we had this infrastructure in place and you had the government focusing on a group of people. Maybe it's racist truckers on Parliament Hill. Maybe it's, you know, misogynistic people who don't want to take the vaccine or whatever it was that, that Trudeau said. But the fact is, is that they're hyping up such polarization in society that it, that it could get to the point where people are saying, oh, well, why don't you just shut those guys off, turn the switch off on those people, and they would have the infrastructure in place to do it. And, and there is one more element to this, and I know that some of the major credit card companies are actually starting to uh, do, do trial runs on something very similar, just slightly modified to a social credit score, where they're examining the purchasing behavior. And if your purchasing behavior is not deemed to be more green, then they start to throttle back your uh, the limit on your card. So this is where you have a big corporation who is deciding what is green, not you. And they're deciding that if they if you don't come into compliance with their green initiative or their green policy, they start to reduce your uh, spending power, or your purchasing power. And if you don't have actual cash on hand to do that, you're now at the mercy of making sure that your policy or your purchases always comply with some sort of a, a social engineering, um, social indoctrination program that aims to be, let's say, for example, more green or whatever. So, you know, what do you do? You're in an industry where you rely on fossil fuels for everything and you're using your credit card consistently to buy something that is not known to be green. You're now in a situation where your purchasing power again will be throttled back on your credit cards. So if this is successful, then who's to say that your ATM machine is or your your um, daily limits on your credit on your ATM card? Like there's all sorts of creative things that we could lose our rights and freedoms to spend our money that we have earned in a way that we find most appropriate for ourselves. These are algorithms and social uh, engineering programs meant to modify our behavior. And we're seeing that in China, communist China mm -hmm. right now. And there's already a, an alarm being put out by, by uh, you know, these ESG programs mm -hmm. in the United States that, you know, uh, ostensibly are about 
promoting, you know, positive consumership and things like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're seeing in in China people unable to buy, uh, you know, bus tickets or plane tickets, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, unable to access certain schools just because they haven't behaved the right way in their postings online right. or they've done things that right. the government mm -hmm. claims to be, you know, antisocial. Yeah. And that is that this system opens the door for that very thing. And, and you've seen examples, too, like the most bizarre one that I saw when I first heard of social credit scores was the smiling because of all the CCTV and all of the. Um, the facial recognition software. I mean, I can write that software in about a half an hour for facial recognition. It's pretty easy. And, and that is attached to, you know, social engineering um, doctrine that if you're not smiling enough in public, your score actually gets reduced. That is, that's straight out of, that's straight out of uh, uh, 1984. Yeah, yeah, Big brother. Very Orwellian. It's uh, yeah. crazy. Yeah. Rick, uh, why don't you jump in here? Well, you know what, again, I appreciate, uh, first of all, Tom, your story. People need to realize that uh, this is something that isn't fiction. Mm. It's coming. Yes. And people need to wake up mm -hmm. to the issues and concerns. Your, your very compelling story about how uh, your son and the, and the credit card and, and freezing of accounts. Uh, we don't make this stuff up. No. And people need to realize yeah. that what we are doing is we are sounding the alarm. The Ontario Party is sounding the alarm for people in Ontario right now. People need to wake up and pay more attention to what's really going on. They cannot continue to put their head in the sand and think that it will go away. This isn't going away, mm -hmm. but we can slow it down and maybe with an Ontario party, we can in fact stop it. We have to stop it dead in its tracks because technology is advancing uh, far beyond what anyone could ever imagine, especially at the rate in which it is it is advancing. But people need to realize, right now, you still have a choice. You don't have to download that app on your phone. You don't have to follow this. Uh, those are those of us who had personal made personal choices at the very beginning. And while we we had uh, we had we were locked down and we weren't able to do a number of things that we maybe could have because of people making a different choice than what we had. But that's okay, that's okay. And there's gonna be some growing pains. People need to realize that uh, this is coming. Uh, the Ontario government has been talking about by the end of 2022, and there are a lot of things have to happen, but people need to have their voice heard. If you say nothing, then others will look at it and say, well, then you are complying with what we are doing. And that is so wrong. We need to have people speak up. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Thank you so much, Rick. Glad to be here with you today. Remember to vote Ontario Party in this upcoming June election. God bless you and God bless Ontario.